Let's talk a little bit, uh, if I could, about um, an incident where one of our officers was assaulted. He was attacked, really, is a better word for it, um, last week. Uh, Officer Spencer Bernson, and some of you may have seen this in the paper. You may have seen a story about it on the TV news. They covered part of it. And I want to talk a little bit about it tonight and show you some of the video and unpack it a little bit because I think it's important for us as community members, as people in the midst of this debate, ongoing debate and controversy regarding law enforcement in this country, and as policymakers to see what we're dealing with and what really what officers are dealing with. So I'll start by saying this, and again, I don't usually use notes, but I, think I, I would like to hear the Oxford English Dictionary's word of the year for 2016 is post-truth, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Put another way, facts don't matter. What matters is how you feel and your perception and how it supports your previously held beliefs. And social media is really sort of seeing that become very, very real. Post-truth is being used mainly in terms of the election, and we've heard it discussed that way, but it's also very applicable to law enforcement and to the incidents that we're dealing with and all of our current controversies and debates. Use of force, trust, body cameras, accountability, criminal charging of officers, and a lot more. So here's my truth. Police officers do an incredibly tough job. We almost always do it right. We are doing it better and better all the time. I know that's not everyone's truth, but allow me to explain why one police call that we had here in our city recently brought all these issues to the surface. So before I play this, I wanna talk about the suspect. The suspect is a 33-year-old African-American man. He's had very frequent contact with our officers. Many of the previous calls that we've had have involved possible mental illness and threats against officers. He was at a fast food restaurant in East Bremerton, picking through garbage and bothering customers. The manager asked him to leave, and as he angrily left, he smashed his fist against the plate glass window in the restaurant, breaking it. So people in the area called 911, gave the dispatcher the description, and stayed on the line providing his location as he walked across the strip mall parking lot. So Officer Spencer Bernson, who you see here, here on the left, a veteran officer who, along with almost all of our officers, has had crisis intervention training, was the first officer to arrive. Officer Bernson approached the man and attempted to speak with him. The man apparently clenched his fists, said, it's on, repeatedly, and threw aside his cigarette before abruptly ru rush, rushing and punching the officer. So I'm gonna start this, and this is cell phone video from across the parking lot. It doesn't have audio, uh, but I'll show you later what's being said, and I'm, if I can get my mouse to work here. You wanna just go ahead and start that, Kevin? So you'll see that the man comes up, and he begins to interact with the officer and then attacks the officer. Four seconds go by before the officer is on his back. If you can stop it, Kevin. Now, four seconds go by before the officer is starting to talk to this man, he is attacked, viciously, physically attacked, and is on his back with the man on top of him, punching him in the head. He attempted to deploy his taser, but it malfunctioned, which sometimes happens. Tasers are, are not foolproof. They sometimes malfunction, and he couldn't deploy his taser. He couldn't get to his radio to call for help. So the first call we got on this was, there's an officer down in the parking lot and we see blood. That was the first call that we got. Now what you see as you went from the left here is uh, the bystander who chose not to come tonight because he didn't want the attention. He said he did what anyone else would do, which I don't necessarily agree with. I think what he did was pretty extraordinary, but he didn't just run, he sprinted to help this officer. And if you wanna go ahead and I'll, before I have Kevin let it run again, as soon as he gets there, we're then gonna to switch to cell phone video from inside, and if you can stop that, Kevin. You can see that the man is on top of Officer Bernson, and he is striking him in the head repeatedly. And Officer Bernson, again, the taser has not um, uh, worked. He is trying to get uh, him off of him, and he's frankly trying not to be knocked out. So, again, as I said, count the seconds, exactly four seconds from the initial contact, the officer's been pushed to the ground, the man is repeatedly punching him in the head. Officer Bernson tried to use his taser. It malfunctioned. As the man continued to punch him, the man walking through the parking lot near, nearby immediately ran to the scene, striking the suspect and drawing his attention away from the officer. The bystander struck the suspect until the officer was able to get back on top, maintain control, and uh, the bystander helped by piling on top as well and just sort of sitting on him, keeping the suspect from doing further damage. He was eventually handcuffed, jailed for felony assault. So let's start, we can unpack this a little bit. 
with the suspect himself. He has a violent history and untreated mental health issues. So the question is, why is he on the street in the first place? Why are we dealing with him repeatedly? One reason is because our state has decided to, that to chronically underfund mental health treatment and placement. That is a decision that we made. Many people are under the impression that dangerously mentally ill people who cannot care for themselves are somehow sent away to a place where they're treated or kept off the street, but that is simply incorrect. The legal requirements to get anyone placed in mental health treatment involuntarily is extremely high in this state. And even if it weren't, the state has no room to put patients. The result is that these individuals are either in our jails, where they really don't belong, or our police officers are doing the best they can to deal with them repeatedly, day after day, sometimes several times a day with the same person. Our suspect in this case would be one of those persons. If we really want to reduce incidents of uses of force and disturbing viral videos of police shootings, by far, the most effective way to do that would be to have a place to take people with serious, untreated mental illness. So once the subject started to interact with the officer, there are many people who would point out that the officer needed to de-escalate the situation. If you see the video, you will note that throwing away a cigarette, announcing it's on, and punching the officer does not lead to a defective de-escalation. Also, you'll note from the video that the suspect is not resisting or using violence to get away, but is in fact attacking the officer aggressively. I think it's easy to diminish or underestimate just how dangerous this is. Within four seconds, the officer is fighting to keep the man from rendering him unconscious. Remember that a police officer cannot be knocked out, cannot lose the fight. The result is a firearm being immediately available to the same violent person who just assaulted the officer and who may now use that firearm against the officer in the public. If you watch this video, you may find yourself saying, well, I would have done this or I would have done that. These decisions are, are all required in tenths of a second which are life and death decisions, literally life and death decisions. They crop up at unexpected times and with no warning. This was a relatively low-level call that Officer Bernson went to. He was fighting for his ongoing consciousness, his gun, and his life four seconds after starting to speak with the suspect. The bystander is seen not just running but sprinting to aid the officer. He delivers several blows to the suspect, helps hold him down until he's handcuffed. A few more bystanders eventually come forward, lay on top of the man who kept trying to get up and fight. When I called the bystander, by the way, the next day to thank him for his assistance, I identified myself and he had two questions. The first was to ask how the officer was doing. And then he became a little more animated when he asked the second question, which was, why were all those people standing around with camera phones instead of helping? I don't know the answer to that question. And I think maybe we should all be asking that question. And why is it that in our society, that's what people, that seems to be people's default uh, default, um, uh, act in these kind of incidents. So let's examine the video taken by the customer in the pet store. That's the perspective we see now, who is good enough to provide the cell phone video to us. So if we can go to the next slide, actually, Kevin. Okay, so we're going to start this. Uh, let's go to the third one. I'm sorry. Okay, so now what I've done is I've had um, the folks at BCAT to help me with this, to put the audio of what you hear from the people inside the store. So you're not going to hear that, but it's, it's almost unintelligible, but, you, but they, we, we got it out. And go ahead, Kevin, if you want to start it. So this is from inside the store. This is all they see. And what you hear from people inside the store is, you know, they're talking about staying away from the door. No one leaves the store. There's a police beating going on right in front of the store right now. They use the phrase police beating. Are you recording? That's the main uh, concern. Are you recording? Because there's a police beating going on. And as it goes on, they talk about the fact that they're trying to tase a black man. You can go ahead and stop it there, Kevin. If you watch that raw video, it starts right at the point where the bystander is getting to the scene. The audio in the pet store video contains phrases, as I mentioned, from people inside, such as there's a police beating going on in front of the store. There's a black man who is being tased. And it's not okay that three people are trying to get on top of this man. Rather than make negative assumptions about those comments and the people inside the store, let's just acknowledge that they see only a portion of the struggle long after the suspect originally sucker punched the officer. However, we should also acknowledge that people bring preconceived notions and beliefs to anything involving police officers. And again, that has a lot to do with what we're talking about nationally. Both Officer Bernson and I have had people ask us, well, why didn't the officer shoot that suspect? Using deadly force as a man strikes and punches the officer in the face would generally be considered justified based on the imminent danger to the officer and others. However, 
Remember that all officers are human beings making the best judgments in the split second when it's required. And we live in the same society everyone else does. Officer Bernson is very frank when he says the idea of using deadly force against this technically unarmed man who is yet very dangerous definitely was a part of his thought process. Chicago police officer was recently badly hurt by an unarmed man um, when the officer definitively explained afterwards that they would not put their family and the department through the scrutiny and protests that would inevitably follow using deadly force. Which means that yes, some officers are making decisions, harmful and possibly deadly to themselves and others, based on the social media firestorm often based on information that is viewed on social media only by how it supports someone's pre-existing belief. This is on both sides, by the way. People who think that police officers never do anything wrong, those that think that most of what they do is wrong. So again, we're not listening to each other. All officers acknowledge that cops make mistakes. Sometimes cops make malicious and criminal decisions, and they should be held accountable for it. However, we're seeing that facts and deliberate discussion of what happened is being disregarded and spin and viral videos are driving what people believe. And you can really see it in these two different perspectives from two different videos. If the officer had used deadly force in this incident and only the second part of the video was available, we would see only an officer and a bystander struggling with an unarmed man and a group of viewers with a cell phone talking about a police beating. The video of the first half of this assault, taken from across the parking lot, has a citizen saying, Good Samaritan and get him repeatedly. These are two very different perspectives, and the videos, which can be slowed down and watched over and over, are a completely different experience than making a life or death decision with adrenaline flowing while fighting to keep from being knocked unconscious. Recognizing the challenges that officers face doesn't mean that officers should never be held accountable. It just means we better understand that we are asking for perfect decisions, perfect tactics, perfect outcomes every time when dealing with unpredictable, angry, and violent people many of whom shouldn't be on the street in the first place and who are willing to attack officers and every community is dealing with this issue. So as I finish this up, a bystander heroically came to our officer's aid and for that we're very grateful. A troubled black man survives a dangerous interaction and a veteran officer learns that this job demands more and more every day. So we continue to focus on finding ways to hold cops accountable and most of the discussion centers around how to make it easier to criminally charge police officers for decisions made in this type of incident. I hope we can look at our own previously held beliefs and whether we are paying attention to facts or emotion. It is a fact that people of color are stopped too often in this country and that implicit bias is evident in too many institutions in our society, including criminal justice. Reacting and emphasizing sarcastic post-truth Twitter phrases and hyperbole does not help us to solve the problem. It drives us further apart into our polarized post-truth perspectives. People want to know what to do to affect societal change. Here's how. Stop doing anything that is making this polarization worse. If you're getting social media messages that characterize any group, whether it be by race or police officers or Black Lives Matter, it's wrong for everybody. And the fact is you should call, them, call people on it when they use these generalizations and ask them to stop. That doesn't mean we have to be politically correct. It just means we have to be civil and respectful and understand the perspectives of others. And so finally, I'll wrap it up by saying I can't offer anything more eloquent than what our bystander said to a reporter when he was asked about why he helped. He said, you know, it was time to step up and be a part of the community and try to change things. And this incident that really was, was focused on the bystander's good work, which I don't disagree with, that was very important. But I think there's so much more to it, and it's really worth looking at it a little bit more deeply as far as what does that mean to us as a community and how do we improve this in the future? Officer B uh, Bernson is out on medical leave this week. Um, he's got some ongoing issues from this. Um, we hope to have him back in a few weeks, but um, he is well aware of just how close this was. We could have lost an officer. We could have lost a citizen. We could have lost a lot of other things. Um, so these are not conducive to short little stories on the TV news. Uh, these things are complex, and I think it's a challenge for us that we have to look at as we move forward. Go ahead. Um, so if we want to support law enforcement and social justice, which I think go together, um, you know, we're following and listening, to, listening uh, other, to others who agree with us and reinforce us. We should be listening to all sides. Stop assuming that people who disagree with us are closed-minded and stupid. And these issues are complex. Things like use of force, institutional racism, mental health, uh, they're really challenging really challenging. And how do we start to attack this? And finally, we owe it to everyone else to really look at everyone's perspective. So um, that's a long presentation, and I appreciate your indulgence. But again, I think it's important for us to talk about it. Last couple things I want to mention before I finish up. 
Talk about mental health and the challenge it creates for all of law enforcement. <clears throat> I had um, our staff run a list of mental health calls. This was just mental health, <clears throat> excuse me, for the first eight weeks of this year. Every one of those involved a number of officers going out to deal with people who were suicidal, despondent, threatening others, uh, barricaded. That's the first 10 weeks of the year, just the first 10 weeks of 2016. And that affects not just the police department, the fire department, obviously neighborhoods, um, Harrison Medical Center gets that mental health and a lot of other uh, stakeholders. But I also want to offer this, Officer Jen Korn, uh, who was sworn in actually just a few months ago, uh, who came to us and has really been an outstanding officer, especially in dealing with some of these issues. Um, we got a note that was shared with me. Um, she went out to deal with a, a person who was suicidal and she wrote back, just a quick note to say thank you for your kindness and patience. You really did not have to be so great to me. You went above and beyond what your job requires and I won't forget it. You have a really tough job, especially hard on women and you are really kick ass at it. You and the entire department may have, or have been in my prayers, and you guys are always welcome here just to stop in for a cup of coffee or whatever. You really made a difference for me that night, and I truly thank you. Stay safe out there. This was a woman who was in crisis and who wanted to take her own life. And again, I mention this because a lot of folks in our community don't know that we're dealing with this every single day. And there's some good stories as well, and this is what really matters. On to some better things, I would share with you that this week, um, after the, um, the death of the officer in Tacoma. Uh, this is a mom from Bremerton, and, she's, and her, her little boy wanted to know what, what they could do, so they made uh, care packages that had uh, protein bars and hand warmers and you know, goodies in them, and they brought them in, and of course our policy, we, we can't accept these things. So what our officers decided to do is, after, by the way, spending a lot of time with Zach because he's so cute, they uh, decided that they would take these out and give these to people in need this weekend. And with our temperatures right now, there's lots of folks in need. So our officers are out there giving those, uh, those care packages that Zach and his mom brought in um, to folks who need it, especially with this inclement weather. And we also had Shop with a Cop uh, just this past week. This is a check that was donated from our department to Shop with a Cop. Um, that's Lieutenant Penny Sapp with the Kitsap County Sheriff's Office and along with Sue Rufner from Polsbo PD. Uh, they coordinate this every year. Um, the really good looking guy on the left, uh, the guy that's not so good looking behind him is Sergeant Aaron Elton, and that's his son. Um, but um, all of them were involved and went out the last weekend uh, for really a great, um, uh, a great um, program that uh, allows folks that don't have quite as much money to be able to have a little bit better Christmas. And then I just wanted to mention, just so you're over aware of it, Council, that um, we are um, very, very involved in working with Tacoma on some of the needs that they have for their funeral uh, memorial service coming up on Friday after the, the on-duty death of their officer. Um, our officers were part of the original procession. It's a tradition in law enforcement that they have a procession from um, the uh, hospital to the medical examiner's office. Uh, our BP, BPD Honor Guard has been part of that. They'll be part of the funeral service as well. Uh, we will also have on-duty officers at the funeral site. In other words, they need security and people actually working on duty at the time, not just attending. We'll be there um, all night and all day for the, at the funeral site. We're also actually covering patrol shifts for Tacoma so that their officers can attend the funeral. So we'll be working, uh, Bremerton officers will be taking calls in Tacoma Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this week, just so you're aware of it. But again, we're really honored to be able to assist Tacoma PD in this way. We'll be part of the procession from JBLM to Tacoma on Friday. And um, I would just share with you that the folks from Tacoma uh, appreciate not just the, the support of our department, but our community. They said, please, please pass along to your community how much we appreciate it. So uh, a lengthy report, um, hopefully one that we find valuable. And again, um, um, as we enter you know, the holiday season, the end of the year, it's a tough time. Uh, funeral coming up on Monday. We certainly appreciate the support of the council, the mayor, this entire community. This is a great place to work, great place to work. We have a lot of issues to deal with nationally, but it's a great place to work. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Strand. Uh, does anyone on the council have any Thank questions for the chief? I just want to say again, and this is a great opportunity to our police department with that video. Thank you for all you guys do. <laughs> that video brings it to what you guys do, and it's scary. So thank you for everything. That, that means that means a lot to us. We appreciate that. And, uh, Chief Strand, oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Council President, Chief, and um, you know I've got a, I do have to echo Ms. Dog's um, comments, and um, especially to the families, um, three officers um, as a family and loved ones that care about them, and um, 
you know, I, I can't appreciate uh, not only what the officers do, but what, what the families um, do to support, support those officers because they sure, they, they're absolutely necessary to our public and our quality of life. And uh, so I, I do want to put that out. And Chief, I, you know, as, um, as, as the realities keep progressing about how, how our society deals with mental health, I, I hope the communication between the police department and the city council continues as, as new law enforcement um, strategies come forward. I, I think ultimately we want everybody to be safe, and of course we do. But as a council, we are concerned for our law enforcement officers. And um, if there's new techniques or strategies or a new way of doing business, um, I, I hope you don't hesitate to include us so we can help with policy. Thank you. So my question, uh, Chief Strand, is it sounds based on your presentation tonight, uh, we live in an age of phones. You heard mine just go bing, bing. Now I shut it off. But th the fact of the matter is it exists. And it sounds like if you, the officer had a body camera, uh, which we captured not only the video close up, but also the sound, it would help defuse, you know, based on the timing of when people take the video, what their reaction would be. And I know that's a, uh, an issue that's being taken up in Olympia, and you're working firsthand on that. How are we doing on that? Um, your point is very well taken, and I am part of the Legislative Task Force on Body Cameras, and um, we're meeting again, I think, next month in January, and I'm actually going to be responsible for presenting on behalf of law enforcement, and I think I'm going to use this example. I think it's a good one to show um, perspective and why body cameras are important and what it would bring. Um, so I think your question's on point, and, and that's what we're doing. I would, um, I wish I could tell you that it's, I think that there will be a solution and that we'll have an avenue to body cameras in the state. I'm not convinced that we're going to get there yet, but we're working hard on it. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on to the KEDA third quarter report, uh, I'd like to offer the uh, police officers that, uh, first of all, Corporal Jason Vertui, who got his promotion, if he'd like to come up with his birthday. I'm sorry. I'm not good with names. Uh, you, you probably, you've probably faced it all your life, uh, officer. So uh, would you come up here with your family and take a picture of the council, please? Congratulations. 